put in anyway into all those empty beer cans laying in the firebox. He turned around and said, you got any coal? <laughs> Okay. Today is February 16th, 1988. And my name is Joe Todd, and this is an interview with Mr. Omar Keller in Corpus Christi, Texas. Now, do you live in Corpus Christi or Fairview? This, or? this, this is Flower Bluff area of Corpus Christi. See, Flower Bluff used to be a separate town. It's now been annexed by Corpus okay. Christi. So. Mr. Keller, where were you born? Arlington, Nebraska. And when's your birthday? 9th of October, 1917. 1917. Who is your father? Carl David Keller. Carl? Carl David Keller. And your mother? Blanche Woods Keller. Woods was his maiden name? Woods was her maiden name. Okay. And where were your parents from? Uh, father was born in Missouri, and uh, he uh, actually lived in Omaha at the time they were married. Mother was born and raised in Tabor, Iowa. When did they go to Nebraska, your parents? Well, uh, Dad was in Nebraska, well, I guess from around 1900. And uh, they stayed in Nebraska after they were married until all oh, around 19, eight, 1919. They moved to Iowa and uh, moved back to Nebraska about 26. Mm -hmm. And did you go through school in Nebraska? Yes. I started school in Iowa in 1922, and I, when we moved to Nebraska, I finished my high school education in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And what town? Arlington. Arlington. Arlington, Nebraska. Yeah. He graduated what year? 1934. 1934. What did you do after high school? Went in the Navy. And you joined where? At Omaha. Omaha. On the 15th of January, 35. January 35. Had a little depression going on then, about all you could do. I had a scholarship to the University of Nebraska, couldn't use it because I didn't have any money to go with it. Why did you join the Navy over the Army or the Marines? Or? Oh, I suppose being in the middle of uh, the prairie there, the Navy probably attracted me more. And you went to boot camp? I went to boot camp at San Diego. San Diego. Tell me about boot camp. Not much to tell. First three weeks there, they had us in quarantine, and, uh, and we moved out into the main unit. And, uh, and when you say main unit? The main area of the camp, of the training camp, the boot camp, mm -hmm. and uh, most of it consisted of military drilling and uh, a little bit of uh, seamanship, uh, small boat handling, that sort of thing. Had a lot of time rowing and taking the uh, general education tests that they gave, mm -hmm. trying to decide on what part of the navy you wanted to uh, pursue a career in. And you chose I what? I chose area? the Naval Academy Prep School, which I had to have a year of sea duty before I could go. And uh, I was coached on board ship by some young ensigns that were just out of the Naval Academy and was able to pass the test for the prep school in spite of the fact that I'd never had ancient history. So. Okay. Would, could you describe your average day in boot camp? From the time you got up, time you went to bed? Oh, well, the first thing you did was lice your hammock. You slept in a hammock. First okay. thing you did was lice your hammock. Now, what's that? Get dressed. Yeah, I'm, I'm a land lover. No. So, how do you work slashing the, the Wash, hammock? You lice your hammock, you've got to roll the thing up and tie it together in a certain way with certain kinds of uh, hitches and knots. And the uh, chief petty officer in charge of the recruit company would inspect it, make sure that it was done right. He washed up, got dressed, and reported for breakfast formation. After breakfast, you'd fall in for your military drill. Possibly in the afternoon, you might have uh, rowing practice in some uh, rowing cutters they had. 
or you might have uh, rifle range or pistol range. In the evening, after you got done with your drilling, you scrubbed your clothes, hung them out to dry, took care of your equipment. By the time the evening meal was over, you were about ready to hit the hammock. They had hammocks and boot camp. Didn't have bunks. Right. No bunks. Okay. And boot camp lasted how long? Approximately three months. Three months. I think we graduated the eighth of April. Of thirty-five. Mm -hmm. From boot camp, where'd you go? USS Oklahoma. And you went on board where? At uh, Long Beach. Long Beach. When you first saw the Oklahoma, what'd you think? Well, I had visited it before because I had some high school. I had a high school classmate and some other kids from my town were on board. And, uh, I was impressed. It was, a, it was a huge piece of steel. Mm -hmm. I was even more impressed when I had the had duty aboard and uh, found out what went on, on on board the ship. Okay, we say what went on. Okay, my first three months I was in Deck Force, Third Division. And my uh, assigned duty in port was a side boy. What's a side boy? Side boy, they have eight of them. And they are on the officer's quarter deck to render side honors to an officer coming aboard or leaving the ship. And uh, anywhere from two to eight side boys, depending on the rank of the officer. So they have to be ready at all times, as is the band and the Marine Guard. If you have a field grade officer coming aboard. Uh, you're talking like a commander or a captain. Right, right. All right, the captain gets four. The commander gets two. No, wait a minute. The lieutenant commander gets two. The commander gets four. Captain gets six. Admiral gets eight. Side boys. And dignitaries, congressmen and senators and the president, vice president, get eight. Now, when would the band be used? Uh, for a captain or higher. And the, the amount of music they play depends on the rank of the individual. There are certain marches that are played for, like for the President of the United States, there's a special march, and for an admiral, there's a special march. Foreign dignitaries, uh, they would give the uh, national anthem of the foreign country, along with all the other stuff. Okay. Where were your quarters in the ship when you first went aboard? In the stern. In the stern. On the, uh, okay. They were just opposite. Okay, can this. we get that? Can you show us on, on the okay. camera? They were on the opposite side of the ship from right here. Okay. This is the, uh, first, uh, the, uh, third division was in the stern of the ship on the starboard side. Just below the main deck. What's called the second deck. Second deck. And tell me again which division you were in? Third Division. Third Division. And what were your main duties on board the ship? Well, uh, actually, uh, as a seaman in the Third Division, my duties were uh, chipping paint, painting, and holy stoning the deck. And Doing what to the deck? Holy stoning the deck. What's that? Sand and a piece of fire brick and a mop handle, swab handle. You, this fire brick has a dent in the top where they set the swab handle and you run that across the wet deck with sand to polish the teak wood deck. And uh, 20 strokes to the to the plank. 20 strokes to the plank? Yeah. How and long are those planks? Oh, it's the full length of the deck. <laughs> you do a, about a three foot section at a time. And every morning before breakfast you got up and they gave you a cup of real sweet black coffee and he went up and polished all the bright work and swapped the deck. Because uh, brass work uh, corrodes very rapidly in salt water. Now, the brass work was located where? All around the deck, all the fittings. All the fittings on the deck were brass. You had to polish those every morning. Approximately how many fittings would be? Uh, oh, <laughs> I never took count. <laughs> You're too busy shining them. You didn't have time to count them. So how long would it take to polish this brass and swap the deck? Thirty minutes. That's all. Well, but you got the whole division of people doing oh, okay. it. Okay. It wasn't just me. It was a whole bunch of people. The entire division was up there turning too. All the petty officers were standing there, make sure you did your share. Mm -hmm. So you went aboard in thirty-five. Right. Uh, 
Um, what cruise did you make on the Oklahoma? Well, the first thing we did was on the summer maneuvers. We went out and uh, into the Pacific, up not too far south of Alaska, and swung down around Midway Island back into Honolulu in Pearl Harbor. And then uh, most of the time we were just going out for gunnery practice and stuff like that off the west coast of the United States. And then that fall we went into the Navy Yard at Bremerton for overhaul and get the bottom scraped and painted and all that sort of thing. When? And while we were up there, I went to the hospital. Why? They found out that I couldn't pass the physical for the Naval Academy because I had a crooked nose. So they took me to the hospital and cut the bone out of my nose. <coughs> Why would a crooked nose keep you out of the Naval Academy? You could only breathe through one side of it. Okay. So uh, when, they, uh, when I got out of the hospital, the Oklahoma was gone. Well, in those days, they didn't give you a train ticket or an airplane ticket or a bus ticket. Uh, they put you aboard the nearest ship and said, you will stay aboard there and uh, be a passenger but have duties with the crew till such time as that ship hits a port in which you find your own ship. And then you transfer back. So I was on the Arizona for about six weeks that time. Found the Oklahoma in San Francisco Harbor and went back aboard. At that time, they were getting ready to go to the East Coast to take the midshipman cruise in 1936. Is it? 30, is, no, this may not be a fair question, but compare the Arizona and the Oklahoma. Is that a fair question? Uh, yeah, it's a fair question. Uh, the Arizona was what they called a hot ship. In other words, everything was so strictly regulation, you didn't step one inch out of line. Uh, the Oklahoma, we wore tailor made uniforms and all that stuff. The Arizona, no way. Everything had to be right out of the regulation equipment. Uh, Arizona had hammocks to sleep in. The Oklahoma was one of the two battleships that had bunks. Why did they have bunks in the Oklahoma? Just the way they built her. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were two ships that had bunks. Two, two battleships had bunks. Okie was one of them. Yeah. Interviewed one man that he requested the Oklahoma because he heard it was the most unregulated ship in the Navy. Uh, he could have been right. Could have been right. We had a gentleman named Captain Van Auken aboard who was quite a character. Did you know him? Oh, yes. Tell me about him. Uh, Captain Van Auken was uh, really a martinet as far as each junior officers were concerned. Uh, an officer going on liberty, and of course, the officer did not wear uniforms ashore. An officer going ashore would be dressed in a suit, be wearing a hat and a tie. Top coat if it was required by the weather. Uh, the captain, when he went ashore, he had an old slouch hat and uh, usually patched elbows on his coat. He was dressed in a suit and tie and a hat, yes, but he looked like a tramp. Well, after Captain Van Auken retired, he went to work for uh, the Pierce, the, uh, Pierce Fenner, and, was it, uh, you know who I mean, yeah. the, finan the yeah. uh, financial wizards. And uh, he's passed away many years ago now, but uh, he when, was no dummy. Yeah. Um, someone told me that on maneuvers the Oki hit the Pennsylvania. Uh, not when I was aboard. Okay. That made no. That's when Captain Foy was aboard. I think he was the last captain on the Oklahoma. That would have been out of Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Then. Right. Okay. Why did they? take off the cage mast and put on the tripod mast? More or less because of the, uh, how the uh, watchtowers they put on them. They had these, uh, it was easier access to get up the uh, tripod mast and they had uh, masthead rooms up there where they had to watch the people on watch. Now what was on top of the cage mast? That I don't know. I never saw that. Okay. There were some cage mast ships left in the Navy at that time. In fact, uh, the California was one of them. Okay, there's a photograph of the Oklahoma. No. Well, they, they probably had a place for uh, lookouts up there, but not with the visibility and the capability that they have with the, mm -hmm. uh, these places here, you look at the uh, various 
Yeah, they had, I guess, rooms up there. Yeah, there was room up there to uh, do maneuvering around. You can move, maneuver around and look out different areas, different directions, and they had range finders and uh, spotters up there, so. What's your fondest memory of the Oklahoma? I would suppose the midshipman cruise in 1936 when we took the midshipmen over to Europe for their summer cruise. Tell me about it. Well, we, we were received royally in England and in uh, Denmark, no, in Sweden that year, England and Sweden and France. And while we were in France, we were detached from the midshipman crews, put all our midshipmen onto the other two battleships, and we went to Spain to take out refugees. That's Spanish what I want to ask about. We don't have much information on that. Well, I can't give you a heck of a lot, but I was aboard. <coughs> we uh, we uh, worked mostly out of Bilbao, which was on the north coast of Spain, in the uh, Bay of Biscayne. And uh, that is one of the roughest stretches of water in the world. Now, I understand the Oklahoma was fired on the during that period. Uh, no, the Oklahoma was not fired on. Okay. The Oklahoma witnessed uh, some shooting. Yes, we were lying in Gibraltar when a Spanish vessel, Spanish naval vessel was coming through the straits, was fired on by a shore battery in Spain. And the, the ship returned the fire and silenced the shore battery. But the Oki was not fired on. The Oki was not fired on and did not fire. Okay. Uh, we were in the harbor at Palma in Mallorca, in the Balearic Islands, mm -hmm. and uh, we witnessed uh, planes bombing the town of Palma. However, I don't think there's a great deal of damage done. How many refugees did you pick up? I have no idea. The water was so rough some places we had to bring them aboard. We couldn't get a boat alongside the gangway. We had to tie up the boat at the stern and uh, drop a canvas bag down for, with the aviation crane and bring them aboard on a, in a canvas bag on a crane. We, have, we were given two photographs of taking the refugees on board. With the bag? With the canvas? Uh, no, they're just pulling this woman up on board. That's all. all oh. it is. She has a life jacket on. Oh well, they all had to have life jackets on in that yeah. rough water. We bring the motor launch up, and they lower this canvas piece of equipment, a breeches buoy or whatever they wanted to call it, down into the boat. One of the refugees would climb in, the crane would hoist them aboard. It was so rough they couldn't get out of the boat onto the gangway. Now the refugees were from what part of Spain, or do you know? All over. Oh. We made many, many ports. We made Bilbao, we made Cadiz, we made uh, ports on the Mediterranean, about three different ports on the Med. We made liberties in uh, Marseille, France, and in Gibraltar, the crew, because we weren't allowed to go ashore in Spain. Was there any adverse reaction to the Spaniards of you picking up these refugees? Not to my knowledge, no. We also uh, picked up some. Uh, Jewish people with Ger of German ancestry who uh, the German ship would not take. Hmm. There was a small uh, German pocket battleship working along the same area, but uh, they would not take people of Jewish ancestry, so we took a few of those. Why would a German ship be picking up refugees when Germany was helping Franco? Well, there's two sides in that war, you know. That's true. <laughs> they have to have two sides to make a war. Uh, and where where'd you take the refugees? Uh, mostly France. To Marseille? No, we I think we did take some to Marseille that one trip we made there, but mostly up just north of Bilbao there on the French coast. Uh, what was the name of the town Brest or? Yeah, uh, Brest, Le Havre. Uh, well, Brest is south. Isn't okay. It? That would be one place we yeah. took them. Not far. That's in the area around Normandy, isn't it? Oh gosh, I wouldn't know Normandy from my from yeah, Adams off Ox. I mean. Yeah, uh, just north of uh, well Portugal. There you have uh, I think Brest is yeah. the first harbor, then Normandy and on up to the harbor. Yeah, see Portugal. Then there's another stretch of Spain. Spain is Portugal doesn't touch France. It doesn't. No. Oh. I'm uh, not a good geographer. Uh, Bilbao is in that area there, in that in the curve there where France and Spain meet. Bilbao is probably the closest Spanish town to France. Okay. And how long? Did this operation take? Uh, we left there, I guess, around the end of September, first of October. Mm -hmm. I got off the ship 
around the 1st of October in Norfolk, so it must have been in, in September that we left there. Okay. Would you describe your quarters in Oklahoma? It's a, a division quarters, and I have these bunks pulled down. They're three high. I usually got the bottom one. Frankly, uh, the quarters were not exactly luxurious. Uh, we carried our own mattresses, which were horsehair, about an inch and a half thick. And, uh, and how many bunks in each division area? Well, whatever division, whatever the size of the division, it varied with the number of people in the division. I was, after three months in the deck division, I went in the boiler division. And uh, we had quite a few people because we had six boiler rooms and two pump rooms to man. And what did you do in the boiler division? I was a fireman. And what did the firemen do with the Oklahoma? Well, most of the time, I was assigned to one of the pump rooms. And uh, we had, uh, since we were a reciprocating engine vessel, we had a what they call an extractor to take oil from that came out of the engine with the condensed steam. We had, uh, to remove that oil, we had uh, extractors that uh, used Turkish toweling, which we got by the bolt. We'd have to uh, change that Turkish toweling on the extractors periodically, and we'd have to uh, make sure that the uh, feed water and the fuel oil were directed in the proper amounts to the proper places. Then when we hit the Navy Yard, my the main job was overhauling and reseating all the valves in the pipelines. In the boiler rooms, all we had to do there as a fireman was to uh, man the burners. She was no longer a coal burner. She started life as a coal burner. But she had changed to oil when they rebuilt her, I think it was in 1928. Um, now, the boilers, where did you get the fresh water for the boilers? We distilled it. The auxiliary division, the A division of the engineers, uh, took care of the evaporators and the generators for them, uh, all, the, all the auxiliary machinery. And also, supplied uh, engineers for all the boats. The E Division took care of the, uh, the generators. The A Division took care of the steam end of them, the E Division the electric end. Yeah. How often did you have to take on oil? Oh, that I didn't get involved in that so much because I was too junior. Uh, depend on how much, how much sea time we had. I did get to help clean the oil tanks though. Which How do you is a really nasty job. How do you clean an oil tank? You get in a, you get into a, uh, oh, probably you'd say a waterproof type suit, and you get down in those tanks with a chemical and scrub those, scrub the bulkheads, and the, some of the tanks had steam coils in them to heat the oil because we used a very, very cheap, the cheapest possible grade of oil, which was real thick and gummy. It had to be heated to 185 degrees before you could burn it wouldn't atomize it below 185 degrees. What kind of oil did, did it use? Well, just that low grade? Of it was a very low grade of oil. It was sort of a uh, refinery refuse, you might say. And mm -hmm. uh, then sometimes we got lucky, we get what they call Bunker C, which was a lighter oil. Uh, that was a lot easier to handle. And I didn't handle oil until I got onto other ships. I became what they call the oil king on the, in fact, on the Wharton transport, which I was on the first first ship I was assigned to after I went back in the Navy. Uh, I was oil and water king on her, so I'd take care of all the fuel, oil, and all the water. Okay. Um, you told me your fondest memory. What's your least fondest memory of the Oklahoma? Uh, time I served my three months as a messman. It wasn't exactly a great deal of fun. Tell me about that. Okay, you're up before Reveille, get the mess set up. At that time, it was not cafeteria feeding on that ship. It was, I had a mess with 20 men on it. I had to set up two mess tables and four mess benches. I had to go to the scullery, draw my dishes and silverware, set the tables, get, a, get my terrines and go to the galley. I had a stack of five containers that went into a carrying handle go to the galley and draw the food, bring it down, and serve it to the men on the mess. And then I had to clean up the mess, and uh, every morning we had an inspection in a clean white uniform with our coffee pot, and uh, 
spent the morning cleaning up the mess. Every Friday on field day we had to set up our mess table and our gear on deck for the captain to inspect. And uh, in the afternoons we had to clean the compartments. Where they, that is the living quarters where the mess had been set up. We had to do that every afternoon. After we got cleaned up in the morning we usually had what they called breakout. The uh, commissary department would have us go down and break out the meat and the stuff they were going to use for the next 24 hours. In other words, we were busy. It, uh, usually it was from 5 o'clock in the morning until about 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night. We were working. Now why were you on this, this duty? Everybody got three months of mess deal. Mess, they call it mess cook. Everybody got three months of that. Okay. Got five dollars a month extra pay while you're on there. That was to take care of your extra white uniforms that you ruined. And where were the mess tables stored? They were hung from the overhead. They had brackets up on the overhead where you'd hang them. And how large are these mess tables? They would seat ten men, five on a side. Mm -hmm. And so you passed the test for the Naval Academy and you left the Oklahoma at Norfolk. That's right. Were you glad, happy, sad to leave the Oklahoma? Uh, I was rather happy because I'd achieved a goal that I'd had in mind. I, I had been selected for the prep school, which was quite an honor, really. And you went to Annapolis then? Yes, I finished the prep school and uh, entered the Naval Academy in, J in July of 1937 with the class of 1941. And how long were you at the Naval Academy? A year and a half. A year and a half. And uh, for some reason unknown to me or anyone else, I resigned after a year and a half. I was a civilian for about two years. In April 1941, I went and got permission from the Bureau of Naval Personnel. Having been an officer, I got permission from Bureau of Naval Personnel to enlist. I went back in in my old enlisted grade at Fireman Second Class. That was in April 41. I made uh, Fireman First in November. Uh, the following June, I think it was, I made uh, Boilermaker Second Class. And you were, did you go aboard the Warden at that time? Aboard the Warden as a, as a Fireman Second Class. And I think it was 1st of May, around 1st of May of 1941. Now, where were you on Pearl Harbor Day? I was on the Wharton in the Navy Yard at Mariel in California. When you heard the Oklahoma had sunk, what was your reaction? I was very, very unhappy about it. I lost a lot of good old shipmates on that. And uh, my biggest reaction was well, one month after that when we arrived in Pearl Harbor. And I saw the Oklahoma upside down. I was, I broke down and cried. I still almost cry when I think about it. And some wise guy was laughing at me. He said, oh, big baby. I turned around and decked him. And I didn't get charged with anything for doing it. So did you spend World War II on the Wharton? No. I got off the Wharton in uh, April 42. Around well, it was right after I got married. We got married the 5th of April, 42. And right after that, I guess it was in July that I got off. Because after I was married, we made a trip out to uh, New Zealand on the Horton. And uh, got off, and I was uh, the commissioning boilermaker on a new destroyer, the first warship ever commissioned in Los Angeles Harbor, the Kendrick. And... Uh, I left her and was the rebuild boilermaker on the California when they brought her back from Pearl Harbor. Left her and put another new destroyer in commission, the Thompson, at uh, Seattle Tacoma Shipyard. And made four, we took her to the Atlantic. I made four transatlantic convoys over and back with her. Any trouble with enemy submarines or anything on the crossings? We took nine knot convoys, 75 ships to a convoy, took four over and four back and never lost a ship. Two to Casablanca and two to Oran. And two to Oran, we had to go through Jib, and the, the German subs were watching Gibraltar very closely. In fact, the Kendrick, the one I put in commission in uh, Los Angeles, took a uh, torpedo in the stern, one of those uh, German torpedoes that followed the sound of propellers. She took a torpedo in the stern going through Jib. 
One man was killed. He was in the bunk that I'd had. He was in the bunk that I'd occupied. Um, when you went to Oran, what year was that? Oh, it was about the time the Desert Fox went back to Germany. Uh, that 43? Uh, that would have been 44. 44. 44. So you didn't go with the 45th Division from Oklahoma to Oran then? No. They went there, I think, in 43. We were in Oran twice. We took uh, one winter. We took two convoy. Whenever uh, they took Casablanca, we went in there, and the old French, the French battleship that had never been completed, the Jean Bart, was on fire when we went into the harbor. And uh, that would have been in '43. In '44, the winter of '44, '45, we took the two convoys into Oran. And we got back from that, and I was detached and put another new destroyer in commission. She went in commission just after VJ Day. What did you do at VJ Day? I hate to tell you, I got plastered. <laughs> Where were you in VJ Day? Uh, Linden, New Jersey. She tell me about that day. What did you do? Not much of anything. We went around and find somebody that had some booze and got plastered. <laughs> Well, the, the time I heard it over the radio, car radio. I parked my my wife was in the dentist's office there, and I was parked outside waiting for her to come out of the dentist's office when I heard it on the radio. I didn't get involved in any big crowd. There was a bunch of us that were military, were living in a trailer court there in Linden, and uh, we had just moved out into an apartment. But uh, we went back to the trailer court and we hurrahed a little bit. But that's about all. When you heard that the Oklahoma had sunk the Mid Pacific. What was your reaction? I was delighted. That was a coffin for a lot of my friends and shipmates, and I didn't want to see it made into razor blades. I was utterly delighted when that thing went down. I'm glad there was no loss of life involved. Have they removed any of the superstructure from Pearl Harbor that's still down in the mud? I have no idea. I have no idea what lays on the bottom. Because you know when they ride it, all that broke off. Yeah. And I, don't I saw her after she was cleaned up before they took her out for the atomic bomb tests. What the Oklahoma? Yeah. She was out there when they when they had those atomic bomb tests out in the Pacific. She was one of the ships that they towed her out there for that. When was it? Oh Lordy, 46, 47, long in there sometime. Yeah, because I think she sunk in 47. Well, before that. They yeah. brought her back and decontaminated her and sold her for scrap. Yeah. Um, so what did you do after World War II? After World War II? Uh, well, I put that destroyer in commission. I got I made chief and got transferred to the new carrier, the Tarawa. Took her on her shakedown cruise. I wasn't a plank on her. I wasn't on board her when she was commissioned, but I took her on her shakedown cruise. Describe a shakedown cruise. Uh, we went to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, which is the uh, naval. They have a naval training area there, and we trained out of that area and around Puerto Rico and through the West Indies there. Uh, various various training. Maneuvers, maneuvering the ship and battle practice and that sort of thing. And of course, we had a lot of launching and recovering of aircraft on the carrier. I had just, I had been down there before on the Cone, which was the ship I commissioned at the end of the war, and we had a shakedown for her down there too. Then uh, the Tarawa came back, and we went up and down the East Coast. Uh, we had all the VIPs out for cruises, including Father Flanagan, by the way, from the. Omaha home for boys there, or from the uh, Father Flanagan's home. He was one of our guests aboard. Yeah. Various admirals and various other dignitaries. Yeah. And we went to the west coast on the Tirawa and uh, made a uh, Westpac cruise out to Japan and China. And during the time I was on the Tirawa, I changed my rating from chief water tender to chief dispersing clerk. Which is? Finance office. Finance. Office manager for the paymaster. 
I got back and I was ordered, I got the rate change, came through, and a week later I was ordered to shore duty at uh, San Ysidro, California, at Greenfield. How long did you stay in the Navy? 20 the years. 20 years. And did you retire from the Navy? I retired, well, I transferred to the Fleet Reserve, which is equivalent to the retirement. And uh, went to work for the Army as a uh, reserve technician. Stayed at that for 16 years. And, uh, and where was that? That was in Fremont, Nebraska. And the uh, doctor took my blood pressure one day and he asked me if I was eligible to retire. I told him I was. He says, I think I would. So I was uh, responsible for the operation of nine Army Reserve Training Centers. Had a staff of 12 civilians working with me. And uh, I was an administrative assistant to a colonel. And it was a very responsible job. Normally it would go to a major. The man that replaced me is now a chief warrant officer W-4 in the reserve. Of course, uh, I got into that when I was grandfathered. I didn't have to be a member of the Army Reserve to hold the job. Now you do. Mm -hmm. Anything else about the Oklahoma that you want to discuss that we haven't well, talked about? That not that I can think of right offhand. I enjoyed being a member and still am a member of the Oklahoma Association, Reunion Association. Whenever you here, USS Oklahoma, what do you think of? I think of my getting broken in as a sailor. They made a sailor out of me. Boot camp doesn't do that. You learn to be a sailor when you get aboard ship. Do you have any questions about? No, I have none right at this point. Yes, sure don't. No, I was, uh, I started going to the, uh, reunions I think in the mid 70s mm -hmm. and uh, I have a tendency to be looking the other way and somebody nominates me for the for an office in these things and I ended up as the well I was ship's rider for a year and they nominated then they elected me as skipper which is equivalent to the president of the association and uh, then I got into this mess with blood pressure and I resigned that yeah. well I've got that under control now, and I'm also past president of the Wharton Reunion Association, <laughs> which will meet in San Antonio in April. Mm -hmm. I guess we have a good interview. Uh, I'm trying to think anything else about the Oklahoma I haven't mentioned. Um, One of my junior division officers on the Oklahoma is presently a retired sub submarine captain who lives down here in Laferia. Raises grapefruit. What's his name? E. B. Orr. Else B. Orr. And let's see, class of 1936. here. He volunteered for the 1936 cruise at the end of his, when he graduated from the Naval Academy, while he was waiting for submarine school. And I missed it somewhere or another. I looked him up in the index. How long was he on the open? Uh, just for the summer. Just for the summer. Yeah. He made that cruise over and hit Spain and all that. He uh, was very instrumental in getting me prepped for the Naval Academy. His last name is Orr, O-R-R? -R. Yeah. Uh, I get clumsy with pages. 
Box 697, La Feria, Texas. And the zip there is 78559. Okay. Uh, well, I Mr. Think, Keller? I think Bert ever, ever joined the Oklahoma Association. He's he's kind of a stick in the mud down there. He won't travel. <laughs> he won't join anything. <laughs> we visited him down there a few years back. and. Uh, Left there, I was driving on international travel all at the time, and I left there with the whole back end of it full of grapefruit. <laughs> he had 300 acres of grapefruit at the time. Now Bert's a little older than I am, a couple of years older than I am. He's still at it in the grapefruit business. Well, Mr. Keller, I think we have a good interview. I hope so. I hope I've been some help to you. Yes, sir. Um, any specific incidents you can think of on board ship that oh, I, I you care a, to relate? Uh, I was very amused by the fact that uh, we had a copy of certain portions of the ship's log from that Spanish deal mm -hmm. when I was at the convention or the reunion in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. I got looking through there and I found an entry where I had been admitted to the sick bay with uh, oh what did they call it uh, gastroenteritis and it reco I recalled that I had uh, been trading cigarettes with a bumboat for grapes they had those beautiful white Malaga grapes and they were absolutely delicious and I overdid with them and I came down with gastroenteritis I uh, spent three days in sick bay. Well, they had it in the log. That they had <laughs> where's that? Where's that log kept? It's in the Navy Department. Now, I don't know if anybody told you or not, but we have a an enormous collection of Oklahoma memorabilia. Now, Mr. Foreman had it, didn't he? He had it, and it's in the Navy Department Museum now. It's in the is that part of the National Archives. Or? Yeah, I think so. It's in the Navy Department. The Navy Department has a uh, collection, and this is part of that collection. And that, that in Washington? That's in Washington. Now, Dutch and I didn't see quite eye to eye on a few things. He was the historian and I was the uh, skipper, and he wanted to be the skipper too at the same time, so that got my blood pressure up a little bit. It had a little bit of bearing. I, I liked Dutch, he was a nice guy. But uh, we disagreed on a couple of things there. I couldn't do I couldn't do what he was doing for the association, so I just let him have it. Do you have any photographs of yourself on the Oklahoma? Uh, if I have, I, I might have some at home. If I have, I'll try to remember to send them to you. Because uh, we're going to do a catalog, and we're trying to get a photograph of each uh, man on the Oklahoma to go with his interview. I may, I may be able to find one. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you. You're so welcome. <coughs> You staying in town tonight, or? or less the duty duty uh, sections. Duty yeah. sections of yeah. all departments, I think. Yeah, the engineers lost quite a few. Now, when you say duty section, what's? Well, the uh, people that had duties uh, that to perform, I mean, to keep the ship in in uh, readiness as as much as peacetime yeah. would allow. Not everybody can go ashore. The the uh, division, the ship's crew, divide into four sections. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, there's the uh, port watch. Is the first and third, if I'm not wrong. Yeah and the uh, starboard watch is the second and fourth sections. Now they can give three section liberty. In peacetime mostly they give three section liberty. In uh, any time there's any danger of anything happening they give two section liberty. That means the port watch will go ashore first and third sections and the uh, second and fourth will stay aboard. Second section will be the duty section and the fourth will be standby or vice versa. So they've got to have people aboard to operate the uh, machinery and the auxiliary status. They've got to have a head of steam because the galley cooks with steam, yep. and the ship, uh, the electricity is made by steam turbines. And Mr. Esnick is one of the 32. That's yes, what I understand. Yep. Uh, we had a member of the organization who since has died, who was one of the people that helped the 32 get out of there, mm -hmm. and 
he had a restaurant in New York on one of the piers there. Where you come Julio up, De Castro. Oh, I mean, uh, Adresco. Yeah, yeah, Adresco. Joe Adresco. Yeah, Joe Adresco. Right. He showed up in 74 up in Newport in an open Jaguar in a <laughs> with a leather suit on. <laughs> he was I, I come here to make that mistake about Julio De Castro was one of the yard chippers, you know, the yeah. yard workmen that come aboard. And he, he was actually the one that did all the uh, supervision and helping, you know, cutting. Yeah. Chipping and all this. Hydrusco was only a super, I mean, a, a standby observer and and helping uh, with whatever he could. Yeah. He he was had a, mo a motor launch, a, yeah. a, gig, a captain's gig, I think, yeah. was picking up rescuers. And he was went a, on the deck at the time. I think he was more or less taking care of his launch at the time. Oh. Is this the uh, other guy still living? Well, Hydrusco was not on the boat, or well, not on the Oki. No, no, he was. He was solus. He was. He was. Operated a motor launch, or, or on the Solus, what I understand, and uh, he were, he took the captain's gig from what he told me and made rounds picking up survivors, and he heard this rapping on the ship, so he advised the proper authorities and he stayed with this until all the men were taken. Oh, so he's out the one that heard the tapping. Right inside. Yes. He made all the reunions. He was, of course, a very honored honorary member of the right. association. Well, you know, he's he's what I told you about. I, I have the pictures. He, all of that. Uh, he drops a rose yeah. over the Statue of Liberty for each each year since Pearl Harbor, yeah. and he has it blessed by some denom church denomination or religious denomination before it's ever dropped over. The, yeah. Now, well, that's so how I Joe understand. lost his life, I think, flying, didn't Sir? he? He lost his life in an aircraft. Right, crash. his own plane. He had an old uh, Waco. He had a bi-wing. Waco 90? I think it was a 42 model, I think. Oh, that was been not a 90. I remember the old 90. A friend of uh, See me like it. I, don't, I, don't, I couldn't say. When I was a kid, there was a fellow there in Arlington, Nebraska, had a Waco 90 biplane that he used to take uh, barnstorming occasionally. But I never could. I wrote, I wrote a letter of... Uh, to Mrs. Hadresco, and I never did get a reply. So I, I do not know all the details, you know, of the uh, event. Of this other happened. man you mentioned, uh, De Castro? De, Julio De Castro. Is he still living? He was a chief yard chipper, they called it. Chief, and uh, he organized, got all the men. Of course, now they was, uh, I understand, as a Navy lieutenant. Uh, he was he was the actual supervisor or top uh, supervisor know, leading the... Are you in contact with any of these guys? No, I'm not. Only Julio De Castro's uh, daughter. She lives in California. Is he still living? I'm ashamed to say I don't know. Uh, I'm the only one of the 32 survivors. I, at that time, uh, I wrote De Castro a letter. And uh, I wrote his daughter. Hydresco gave me her address, and I wrote her, and uh, Julio De Castro wanted me to come to Hawaii, and he wanted to take me on a tour of the islands, but I never have got to make it. Yeah. And, uh, but, like I say, I'm sorry that I haven't kept communications with the, uh, the daughter. And, uh, you still have her address? Yes, I do. I'd like to contact her to try to contact him to get... Well, he was... He was in pretty bad health the last time, about six, seven years ago. You know, there was one guy, they said, that just died in California that helped cut the men out. Yes. And at the reunion out there, he was confined to a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. But I did, as far as you know, those men, I didn't know any of them, other than just yeah. seeing them when, I, when they brought us out. You probably contacted our uh, ship's writer up in Arkansas. Yes, uh, yes, sir, and also uh, Leon Cole in California. <coughs> and then, uh, CQ Knight in uh, Bethesda, Maryland ought to know a little bit too. I don't know if you're, he, used, he was ship's writer for years. Yeah. Uh, what we plan to do, yeah. I'm going to Kansas City for the reunion, and I'm going to try to do as many entities there as possible. Now that's going to be in May. That's in May. First weekend in May, generally. Yeah. That's a traditional date for it. Uh, it coincides with commissioning date, I believe. She commissioned her on the 1st of May or uh, Let me see. She was... Okay. No, that's the christening date. She was christened March 23rd, 1914. Commissioning date, I'm not sure. I think it was in May. Okay. okay. 
Uh, that, there's some reason for it to be the first week, the first in May, first week of May, anyway. And, uh, what the reason is, I think, was commissioning, but I can't swear to it. She was a good ship. <coughs> Largest reciprocating marine engines ever built. Huh. How large are those engines? But he raised the How large were the engines? Uh, I think there were 28,000 horsepower for the pair of them, something in that area. And uh, I don't remember the exact dimensions. I wasn't in the main division. I wasn't in the main engine division. But uh, as I recall, they had one high pressure cylinder per engine, one intermediate pressure cylinder, and two low pressure cylinders. Uh, this is a triple expansion engine. So, what do you say, triple expansion? The steam expanded. It was used in the high pressure cylinder first and the media intermediate pressure and then it expanded into the, the the expansion of the steam drove them and it drives the pistons down. Well at the full pressure it drove the high pressure, then as it reduced it was reduced in pressure somewhat, then drove the intermediate, then further reduced and drove the two low pressure. And the <coughs> cylinders were a different size. I believe that the high pressure was forty eight inches, the intermediate was sixty, and the low pressure were I think eighty four inches in diameter. They were huge. How many engines were on the Two. Two engines. Uh, now, the old Texas, which is sitting up here near Houston, uh, is had the second largest set of recips, I think. They weren't as big as the Oklahomas. Uh, how much was taken off the Oklahoma she was raised? Did, they, was? did the ship completely stripped or what? I have no idea. I was involved elsewhere and didn't get in on it. The collection and the history that uh, Dutch wrote up should have all of that in it. Now, there's a book in the collection that shows pictures of the various stages of the recovery of the ship, setting it upright and so on. Have you seen that? or? Uh, I've seen a copy of it. Yeah. Do you have any uniforms that you wore in the open? No, I do not. I mean, they're trying to find you. I do not have. Uh, also, I'm supposed to extend an invitation to you on December 7th this year. We're going to open the new Oklahoma display. We have a complete silver service. We have one of the emergency steering wheels. Uh, we're getting quite a few photographs, and we're going to have a whole new display. And uh, have Mr. Esme come up. And then there's two guys in Oklahoma that are on the ship at that Pearl Harbor. And we're trying to get as many members up there. I'd love to do it. I don't know whether I can or not. I'll be here in Corpus Christi at that time. Yeah. It'll be on December Everything 7th. going well, I will be here in Corpus yeah. Christi. Okay. Uh, I don't know uh, how, whether I can handle it or not. I'd like yeah. to drive up. Of course, I've missed any names. Bring the little weekender up with me. Yeah. I don't go much of any place without that little trailer. And I hate motels. Yeah. Well, we'll be in contact with you before then. That's my great grandchildren there on the top of the TV. Three of them. Two girls and a boy. Mm -hmm. the boy was born in September. Oh!